Uh, we're going to go ahead and do some quick introductions. Um, I mentioned uh, I'm Lee Bird, president of BTEC. Uh, we have uh, provided IT security services for credit unions for 27 years. We currently work with over 120 credit unions throughout the United States. Um, one of the areas that is of uh, you know the biggest challenge, biggest concern for credit unions is data protection. It's something that uh, we try to help our credit union clients with, and uh, hopefully we're going to provide some good insight for all of our attendees today. Uh, one of the things that I do want to mention here as we get started as well, uh, we are going to take questions at the end. Uh, you should see on your screen a, um, uh, an area where you can type a question in. Feel free to type in your questions throughout the uh, presentation, and uh, we'll be sure to get to those uh, uh, at the end. This presentation will be probably about uh, 30 to 40 minutes or so. We have two panelists today. Um, I thought this would be important to include uh, some credit union um, employees, some people that work in the credit union industry. These are your peers. Um, I know one of the special things about working with credit unions is that collaboration, that peer support. Um, and these two gentlemen, I think, are going to provide some really good insight here for you today. Uh, first, we have uh, John Lockie. Uh, John has uh, 15 years in IT, the last five years at Caltech Employees Federal Credit Union. John is the AVP of Infrastructure and Security. We also have on the call today uh, 22 years in the credit union industry, Rick Menjivar. Uh, Rick is uh, the CIO of Chafee Federal Credit Union. Um, one of the things that uh, Rick offers also is sort of a unique perspective. Rick has worked both um, uh, in credit unions and also as a vendor providing uh, services to credit unions. So Rick has kind of seen both sides of uh, IT. So uh, John and Rick, thank you very much for being our peer panelists today and for being on this uh, webinar. And uh, with that, we'll get started. Uh, here's our agenda. Um, what we want to do is sort of present some thoughts, some ideas on uh, the credit union landscape, um, some of the threats that you'll see out there uh, that can affect your data, and also uh, some methods to protect the data. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, I often see is that we all know, sort of know what best practice is. We all, uh, as um, IT professionals, often uh, can tell everybody what the best practice is, but sometimes we don't always do what is best practice. We forget, um, we, uh, we run into budget challenges, whatever it may be. Some of this information today might seem like it's stuff that you learned 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but uh, again, as a reminder, uh, hopefully this will uh, bring some new information to you and just kind of uh, uh, again, provide you with some insight on best practice for data protection. Uh, I'm going to tell a quick little story. I turned 50 last year. I went to a new doctor. I said, how do I live to be 100? It's a true story. And the doctor kind of looked at me, put his hand on his chin. He said, you need to exercise, you need to eat well, and you need to get plenty of rest. And I sort of laughed to myself, and I thought, you know what? That's exactly what I knew I was supposed to be doing. Um, but, you know, here I am paying a doctor to, to remind me or to tell me. Um, so maybe this presentation is going to sort of remind us about some of those things uh, related to uh, data protection as well. I'm going to ask uh, John and Rick to provide some insight um, uh, on this slide. The credit union landscape. Um, so, you know, this is one of those areas uh, that just kind of uh, starting off here, we're seeing a ton of data growth, um, hyper growth. And, uh, you know, my perspective, what I'm seeing a lot is a tremendous amount of imaging data. Um, SANS are popular or being put out in, in all credit unions now, depending, you know, regardless of the size of the credit union. Um, I'm also seeing a tremendous amount of data growth in email, email archive. So, uh, John, if I could ask you to um, chime in here, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, what are you seeing as kind of the, the biggest area of data growth in your credit union? What are you seeing credit dealing with uh, as far as this tremendous amount of data growth? 
Uh, that's such a good question. You know, I think of the three C's for myself. Um, you hit on one of them, complexity. Uh, complexity is expanded tremendously in the last like decade maybe uh, where things used to be a lot simpler um, each year they get more complex you touch on sans storage virtualization um, it's harder and harder to understand compliance being the other thing the other C um, auditing uh, having to deal with outside audits people coming in and asking about your data where is it at uh, who's in control of it who has access to it uh, where are your backups who can access those and then confidentiality is another C but security really um, making sure that you're securing the backups you got issues with um, well I think you'll touch on this a little bit but issues with ransomware malware uh, dealing with data encrypting data um, taking it over and then of course who has access to that information where uh, not just malware is an issue but like employee access and stuff like that and who who can get to what kind of plays into compliance but those three things the complexity the compliance and the confidentiality of data kind of make things a lot more difficult for us in credit union space versus outside uh you know john you uh you're you're right and uh you mentioned complexity i know virtualization is uh supposed to simplify it environments but um <laughs> you know it's right <laughs> But it does sort of lead a whole nother discussion about uh, data protection for virtualized environments. There's so many different ways that you can do that. And uh, yeah. with all those different ways, that does uh, provide an increased uh, level of complexity, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's, as you know, it's, it's given me a job. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, excellent. Hey, Rick, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, um, I know compliance requirements. Uh, for data retention, data destruction, all of that. Um, you know, give me some feedback on kind of what you're seeing and what your thoughts are as it relates to some of the, the compliance issues that you're faced with as it relates to, um, to data. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. Um, keeping up in today's day, kind of like what John was saying earlier, compliance. Compliance is huge. Uh, keeping up with it, uh, not getting clear answers, or just clear understanding of what these things are. It doesn't matter whether you're a $5 million credit union or a $2 billion credit union, we still all have the same uh, compliance issues. The ever-changing regulations, when we have auditors that are either private or federal auditors that come in, one will say one thing and one will say the other. It's very, very confusing. We really, all, we really almost need a full dedicated FTE to manage a lot of these different layers of of the compliance that we have. I remember back in the day we would order a computer from Micron or HP and we would get it in the office, we would open it up, you know, we'd stick email on it, our core software on it, and we'd put it out on, on the teller line or out in, on the network and we were ready to go. Now it's a lot more work. So as John said earlier, it's a lot more complexity nowadays. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, you know, the uh, that uh, third box there, protection of electronic member information. You know, everything that we do uh, for this credit union is for the members. And um, I know in the conversations I have with our clients and with credit unions, um, sometimes we uh, just sort of skip past the member. And, and uh, But at the forefront of this discussion really is um, the member. Uh, I know, uh, you know, I can't even imagine what it would be like for any of us to have a, an issue or where any data might be compromised, uh, where that member information could be out. So, um, you know, as we go through this, I know I'm definitely uh, going to spend a lot more time, um, you know, just uh, reminding ourselves that what we're doing this for is for the members. So uh, we're going to keep that in mind. Uh, we're going to go on to the next slide here. So what causes data loss? Um, you know, again, this is that part that I spoke to earlier about sort of the uh, Captain Obvious stuff here. But um, I'm going to throw a couple of wrinkles out there for you. Accidental deletion. So that's, you know, the person uh, that we uh, have to do data restores for on a weekly basis. They can't seem to find their data. They can't seem to stop hitting the delete button on their spreadsheets, whatever it may be. Um, we all know who those people are, but it does happen. Uh, John mentioned earlier ransomware. We're seeing it. It's bad. And um, especially viruses or malware that will lay dormant in your uh, in your environment. So, you know, we all 
have a pretty good idea of how to secure our perimeter, but uh, viruses, malware, they can get into the environment through different methods. And, um, and then the worst case is, you know, that like I said, it does lay dormant in the environment. We don't know about it until all of a sudden it, it strikes. Um, I'm in Southern California. We talk a lot about earthquakes out here. Uh, some news stories this morning about new fault lines that were discovered. Uh, for those that are attending on the uh, East Coast, I know Hurricane Sandy was horrible. Matthew, just a couple weeks ago, um, really did some damage in North Carolina and South Carolina. So these natural disasters obviously uh, will, uh, will come up. Power outages, uh, hardware failures. Um, you know, I'm going to mention one that happened here in Southern California um, about four years ago. A credit union was broken into, and uh, they didn't try to steal cash out of the vault. They went into the data center, and they stole the servers. They wanted that, uh, that data. And uh, so, um, you know, that's actually, if you, <laughs> you know, the, the worst case of data loss, the actual having theft, uh, the machine, machines, the servers physically stolen out of the, uh, the data center. So, um, you know, and then I think uh, when we initially were implementing data protection solutions, it was mostly because, uh, you know, the, the server hardware wasn't as reliable. We had you know, hard disk drives that would crash. And prior to RAID arrays, we just were mirroring data. So, you know, again, it's sort of been an evolution. But uh, think of, uh, you know, what would cause data loss in your environment today. And sometimes it's even something as simple as uh, or straightforward as or my environment's working, but um, uh, we're not able to get that information out because we have an Internet outage. So I know we all rely heavily on uh, the Internet for providing services to our members. If uh, the internet is out uh, in your data center, obviously that could be considered a disaster. So lots to think about here uh, when we ask a simple question, what causes data loss? So this is the part where we're gonna hopefully start building on some ideas about uh, how we can protect that data. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think we can boil this down to just two bullet points, but um, I've always found that uh, this is probably the best starting place, the best jumping off place uh, for us when uh, we're looking at, at doing data protection. Uh, the first is determining, determining your RTO. And uh, I really don't like using acronyms all the time because not everybody knows what RTO stands for, but it's your recovery time objective. So for that data, how quickly, if that data were lost, do you need to get that data back? Is, uh, you know, is an hour uh, fast enough, or does it need to be faster than that, or, or is 24 or 48 hours okay? Um, when determining your RTO, uh, I always recommend to our uh, clients to protect all data. I think sometimes we um, will look at certain types of data and say, you know what, in the event of a disaster, uh, we really could get by without that data, um, and uh, often those departments uh, will will come forward at some point and say, "By the way, where is my X Y Z data?" So uh, as you're as you're defining or determining RTOs, make sure that you look at all of your data. And then the last is our second area is uh, determine your requirements for on-site and off-site. So um, we see this a lot also data that is uh, backed up but uh, is still uh, either sitting in the same physical data center as the uh, primary data um, or maybe it's uh, you know at a, at a regional branch location for a credit union that branch may only be a mile or two away um, does that uh, meet your out of the region compliance requirements I, I put out of the region in quotes here because um, you know in speaking with uh, clients, uh, the NCUA or um, uh, will will mention that they want the credit union data out of the region, but there really isn't ever any clear definitions on what that is. Is it 10 miles? Is it 100 miles? Is it out of the state? Um, you know, where uh, where does that actually uh, you know out of the region um, kind of effect or come come to uh, to fruition? So, um, John, I know. You've done some pretty neat things there at Caltech Employees Federal Credit Union. Uh, can you give us some uh, sort of background or guidance on what you've done to sort of uh, meet your off-site compliance requirements? 
Yeah, um, well, you know, at a previous FI, actually, just to touch on this, we were at a, a vendor's facility for co-locating our DR site. And that was actually, so we're in LA, I'm in LA County, and our offsite was in Orange County, and I was only there for one examination window, and definitely that was a struggle in trying to explain how we justified that. It wasn't far enough, I think it was about 60 miles, and we, we had issues uh, appealing to the examiners on that one. But here, we are out of state um, with our DR, and that's a slam dunk. Uh, we actually co-locate with our core provider. Uh, they're kind enough to offer services for uh, physical location of servers for additional DR purposes. So not only do they handle uh, some of the core heavy lifting and DR, but we can co-locate our equipment with them in their data center and then perform our uh, additional infrastructure recovery off-site. And then, of course, being out of state, we have to plan for other contingencies, like how to get personnel up there, um, remote access in the event, obviously, of a major disaster in Southern California. Will I even have internet access down here? And so uh, there's additional problems that get presented when you talk about being out of state. Uh, physical access to machines is a lot harder. So being with the core provider uh, gives us a tremendous benefit because they have personnel up there, too, uh, who are trained on the core and then uh, who have also, they also have network engineers and other folks that we can a phone call, uh, get assistance with bringing our infrastructure up in a real disaster. Um, That's great advice, John. Yeah. And that, I think, you know, what you've done, uh, you know, maybe that's a conversation that more of us should have with our core provider, asking them, uh, you know, if there's additional services that they would be willing to do, whether it's, you know, housing a sand for us or housing a vault for us, that kind of thing? Yeah, core core, or even sometimes uh, my previous FI, we partnered with our online banking vendors who we were with, um, but they also happen to have the infrastructure in uh, place to facilitate us storing equipment. We didn't have to, you know, I was going to make a joke about, well, I just replicate everything to my house. What's wrong with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but a lot of vendors that we use have better infrastructure than us in place. They, they're, they're, um, you know, a service provider. And so they've got that. And a lot of times they'll be able to rent cage space or rack space out for you to drop your own sand or your own equipment and kind of do what I would call a hybrid solution. I mean, I've worked in another vertical where we, we, we used um, a hybrid DR scenario where the, the target for our backup was actually not owned by us. The equipment was not owned by us. Uh, which served really well, but doesn't work so much in financial space because then you're talking about dumping all of that data into a cloud provider effectively, and then you've got compliance and you've got confidentiality issues there too. So, yep, and we're we're, we're going to talk about that, that yeah, that the cloud and compliance and vendor due diligence and all that. But Rick, um, RTO. So here's the million dollar question. How do you go through your data and uh, determine the RTO for that data? Is there kind of a checklist that you do? Do you get your uh, different departments involved, uh, the board? You know, how, how do you come up with an RTO for, for the data that you're trying to protect? All of the above, actually, but also looking at the retention policies and schedules that we have in place. A lot of those come from the NCUA, um, the, the leagues, and things of that nature. But here's the other million dollar question, is how much data is too much data? We all know that bandwidth, right, we, have, we could have a lot of bandwidth and we can move data as much as we want, but how much data is really too much data? And is too much data a liability? Because if we don't put everything in gear, we don't have all the matching data all across, that can become a liability and we can become written up for, for those things as well. So we try to keep it simple. We talk to all the different departments, the board, the management, and we only put out there what we need to put out there. Um, and we, we want to make sure that it's, that it's clear and it's pre precise um, and that we go by all the retention policies that we have in place. That's the other thing, is backing up according to those policies and keeping those records of the purges and the policy changes. Because though you may have the policy changes um, and you may do them, they might not be changed on the policies and you can be written up for that as well. But you have to get Matt, everybody so involved. Matching the right. and so so then you have to stay on top of that policy for that RTO. That's a whole other challenge, and you got to remember to keep that updated. Yeah, because I 
I've seen that. That's that's one area that comes up a lot in audits these days is you're doing the best practice, but your policies don't clearly define or, or don't match what your practice is. Then there's also the recovery time objective of how much do you want to recover in your 24-hour span, Yeah. your 48-hour, your 72-hour. What's the most important thing? You have part of the, you know, of the organization that says, oh, our email has to be up within 24 hours. That's a good debate. Right. What's more important, <laughs> your email or your core or your other um, auxiliary products such as ATMs, home banking, mobile banking, all the other things that the members do expect. We right. could do without email for, you know, a day maybe. There's always – now we have texting, we have FaceTime, we have Snapchat. You know, if we all go on the DR, we're all going to Snapchat each other. <laughs> there you go. All right. I wasn't. I, I didn't see that one coming, Rick. But there you go. Snap that. The next. Also, one. also, hey, Lee, to touch on the RTO RPO terminology too. I think I've seen. Uh, I would hope that this is a commonality among everyone on the call. But I've seen the examiners expect us to speak in those exact terms, and not right. just in policy, but to the board too, and for everybody to be speaking the language of RTO and RPO, and in agreement with what is acceptable and what's not. And yeah. for us, we drive that number based on what our uh, DR testing produces. Cool. So we test it, and then we develop it. But we speak in those terms for sure. Excellent. You know, uh, one, one last thing on RTO here. Um, our sponsor today is uh, eVault, which provides uh, cloud data protection services. And, and uh, eVault has a cool solution um, where they actually have a cloud disaster recovery service. And what I like about it is the SLA, the service level agreement, is based on RTO. So, uh, you know, they have one hour, 24 hour, 48 hour RTOs. And, um, you know, the nice thing about that is, you know, especially in the case of a disaster, uh, white glove service, somebody else is responsible for that RTO and getting it back up. So uh, lots of vendors out there now are focused on that RTO. They understand that, that it's important for credit unions, and uh, it's kind of neat to see that, uh, that that's happening now. So uh, compliance. This is tricky because uh, I have a hard time with this word, but ambiguous. Uh, it comes up a lot. So the NCUA rules. Um, FFIEC, the, you know, does the Graham Leach Bliley Act really affect credit unions? Um, you know, uh, some of the credit unions that um, provide financial services, they might fall under SEC guidelines. So knowing the different rules uh, is important because, um, you know, when the examiner's in, they're going to speak to you about uh, some of these things. So I have a few of kind of the, the, the main ones on the screen right now. Um, part 748 and Part 749 of the NCUA rules, they talk about encryption of member information, electronic member information. So in any data protection that we do, whether the data is at rest, data is at transit, um, on-site, off-site, that data has got to be encrypted. And, uh, and then, you know, is 128-bit level encryption good enough or do we have to look at 256 now? And, and uh, so that's important. Um, even things like regularly testing the controls um, and making sure that uh, that data recovery uh, is possible. That's huge. So we've, I keep using the word data protection, but really what we're talking about is data recovery, right? We've got to be able to, to access or get that data. So, uh, so that's super important. Um, you know, and, and uh, uh, the FFIEC, I know uh, recently they've been um, – kind of really speaking to credit unions a lot about uh, data encryption for, um, you know, data at rest. And are we all doing that? Is it just the data on our storage uh, at the SAN level, or do we also have to worry about encrypting, um, you know, uh, PCs or teleline machines, that type of thing? So um, understanding the compliance requirements is really, really important. And that's, uh, again, just a few of the key ones here. Um, 748, 749, we, we definitely want to make sure we understand those uh, as best as we can. All right, technologies. Um, this, is, this slide is really, uh, I think, speaking to um, best practice and understanding some of the newer technologies and whether or not they provide um, all of our data protection needs. One of the, one of the, uh, the, the one area that I'm seeing a lot of credit unions leverage 
is SAN replication or site-to-site -site replication. This technology is phenomenal, and it's it's uh, if you're not doing it or it's new to your credit union environment, it's the ability for you to put a storage uh, outside of your data center uh, location and have that data replicated in near real time to that uh, to that offsite appliance. Um, unfortunately, I am seeing some environments, some credit unions, thinking that that is their data protection strategy and that that is, in quotes, their backup. Um, obviously, uh, if you look at it, um, you're, you're not going to have the ability of recovering data that's deleted or data that's corrupt because those types of things are going to, um, in almost real time, uh, replicate over to that secondary vault. So. Uh, or secondary SAN. So keep that in mind. Um, some solutions like snapshotting. SAN snapshots for recovery are great, but uh, sometimes those sna snapshots may only keep a, a very short period of time. It might just be a certain number of snapshots within that day. It could be that uh, those are rolled off the SAN, uh, you know, like in a week, and that wouldn't give us the ability of going back and recovering if we had to, um, you know, at a further t uh, time, point in time. Um, CDPs. Lee, so, Lee, yes. sorry, sorry. Yes. Ahead, they yes. also may not be. They also may not be application aware. That's something a lot of people don't think about. Uh, Exchange, Active Directory, Core, all that stuff. Snapshots are great, but not application aware. Oh, that's a great point, John. Not you know, I had not I hadn't always. even really thought about that, but you're right. If you needed to do recovery from like a SQL database. Um, maybe you just wanted to, or even in an exchange server, you just wanted to restore a mailbox. Is that possible with a SAN snapshot? Probably not, right? You're probably doing more. There's kind usually of a additional recovery. software. Yeah. Yeah, you need additional software, but yeah. Awesome. No, that's a good point. And that's uh, so again, weaknesses come up. Um, you know, these these are, but these these technologies are there are values for them, but uh, making sure that your data protection strategy includes the ability of recovering uh, at many different points. Uh, that's that's uh, what becomes super important. Thanks, John. That's a good point. I hadn't even thought of that. So uh, we're going to go to, again, going back to my uh, doctor uh, story. This is the stuff we know, and uh, are we always doing it? But, um, you know, what I like to call point-in-time backups, um, it's the regularly scheduled backup. It's the one that kicks off every night at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., whatever it may be. Uh, you know, sometimes we might have uh, for... Um, certain log files or something, T logs, we might have uh, a backup job that runs multiple times throughout the day. But uh, a point in time backup is still something that your credit union should be doing. Um, you should have those backups that have uh, multiple retentions. So your retention schedule, uh, you know, sometimes I've heard it called the grandfather, father, son type of uh, schedule, but daily, weekly, monthly, annual retentions. Again, that ability to go back. Um, to a point in time and recover that data if you needed to. Uh, with ransomware, this is kind of a big deal. Um, you know, if that ransomware uh, infected uh, the data maybe back on October 15th, um, five days ago, we want the ability of going back maybe on the 14th to recover that data. So, um, you know, Rick, uh, you know, how far back do you go on your retentions? Do you do annual retentions? Do you keep data longer than a year? Is it necessary? Um, kind of your retention thoughts. What, what, what sort of best practice do you guys do? Yeah, I think we try to make sure that we abide by all of the compliance that we have out there, the backup frequency, the daily, the weekly, the monthly, the quarterly, the yearly. We're keeping about at least 24 months out there. And I'm really grateful for that, especially with the evil technology that we have. Before I came to Chafee Federal Credit Union, I'm not sure exactly when, but sometime last year, um, they were hit with the ransomware. And um, it wasn't very big, but we did lose some data. Um, unfortunately, when I came in, or fortunately when I came in, one of my first questions was, why didn't anybody go back to one of the, the data sets from you know six months ago? And they all kind of looked at me and I was able to go in there and, and grab all the data and bring it back. That was critical to some of our staff because they were having to redo some of the documents that they had out there. So having those data sets out there, minimum of three and storing them off site, but I can't stress enough, 
one thing is testing them because you can do as many as backups if you want but if they're not tested and they're not functional those backups do you no good so I work for financial institutions where we tested it monthly we did role plays where we actually went out there and pick the day where we would go out to our, to our network admin and say, hey, grab the backup from this data. I want you to restore this particular directory. And from time to time, it was either corrupt or not working. But what you don't want to be, uh, want to be into is be up against the corner when you're looking for something and that backup didn't work or it was corrupt. So testing, 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 and making sure that the that data sets are good is extremely important. Not only on uh, if you still have tapes or if you put it on CDPs, right on the, on the cloud, but for all the different ones. Um, what we try to do is we try to recover um, within that 24-hour goal, right? So we give that test to our network administrator, also to our core administrator and our applications administrator, make sure that they can all grab that data back. That's a good point, Rick, testing. And, you know, again, it's, uh, you know, it's not really a backup strategy. That. It's not a backup strategy. It's really a recovery strategy, right? <laughs> so right, we use the word backup so often. But hey, John, I think sometimes um, we forget about the basics of testing that data. And yep. once in a while, we'll go back to grab something. We're like, oops, uh, we must have missed this setting, or the the tape wasn't cleaned, or it was just corrupt data. So we need to continue to test it. Yep. Excellent point. So. Um, John, you know, uh, I know you guys probably do multiple types of data protection backup strategy. Um, are you using point in time? I mean, not to put you on the spot, but is there kind of, are, do you have like daily backups of, uh, of your different directories yeah. and, and services? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Big time. Okay. I mean, when you get a technology in place, what does it cost you really to do point in time? I mean, with differential backups, it's extremely cheap. And now with, uh, you know, single instance storage type of technologies or deduplication technologies. It's so cheap. I mean, it's affordable. Why not? I mean, why not have right. that data avoiding, like you've touched on corrupted data? Uh, the more you have, the more chances you are, uh, or the better your odds are against um, being stuck with just a bunch of backups that have a bunch of corrupted data or bad data. So we layer by application for sure. So we have a couple questions coming in. We'll, we'll answer those. Uh, at the end, but we've got two comments. Uh, people both said, yes, test your data protection. Test it, test it, test it. So good point, Rick. So uh, let's go here to uh, the next slide. We are going to talk about tape. Um, OK, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I can't see you, but I know there's still people out there that use tape. And uh, uh, you know, tape is um, has been around. I think uh, the, the joke I heard was, you know, the the day after the hard drive was invented, the tape tape drive was invented. Uh, as long as we've had data, we've had tapes, it seems. And, um, you know, I still see a lot of, especially core solutions, core systems that are still backed up to tape. And uh, I had one client that communicated to me that their updates for their core still came on tape, and that's why they had to have that tape drive. Uh, so even if uh, having a tape drive attached to your core is required for things like updates or whatnot. Um, you know, is tape always the best way to back up the data? Uh, one of the things that comes up um, a lot during audits is having all of your tapes uh, physically accounted for. So if your tape rotation was 21 tapes and you can only find t 20 of those 21 tapes, you know, whether your off-site courier can't find one or, uh, you know, you put them in a lockbox and took them down to the, to the uh, lobby for that courier to pick up and that box disappeared, that's loss of member information, possibly. That's, uh, that's a big one. So, um, you know, I guess my point being is with tapes, it's, uh, you know, the having to physically manage that. And when I use the word tape, I think something else, uh, you know, some of us now are using like uh, external USB drives or portable USB drives to, to back up data. Um, it's a physical appliance. Anytime that we can uh, eliminate that physical uh, appliance or physical device, that might be, um, from a security standpoint, a benefit for us. So keep that in mind as you're kind of developing your uh, uh, data protection strategy. So we're, this next one is kind of the, this is the biggie cloud this is where everybody is using this word cloud everybody talks about leveraging the cloud for data protection 
Um, you know, I think one of the confusions that comes up, especially if, uh, when we're speaking to maybe um, executives, um, is the cloud can be uh, confusing. And I think understanding the difference between a public cloud and a private cloud is important. So um, especially when we are communicating to uh, maybe it's our board or executives, you know, a private cloud is a vendor that's using uh, data storage or data protection strategies for their clients. Um, I mentioned earlier vendor due diligence. It's so important. With a private solution, knowing who that vendor is, uh, asking them for things like their SOC or their SSAE 16, their financials, their insurance, where is my data going? And, and having them tell you it's going to be in this vault, in this state. Um, you know, I've seen that with some, uh, you know, Rackspace, Amazon, Microsoft, some of the bigger vendors. They can't always guarantee that your data would even stay in the United States. Um, and that can be concerning, especially from a compliance standpoint. Uh, we know our data is supposed to stay in the U.S. It can't go out of the country. So, um, you know, but, but with that said, the cloud definitely has some, uh, some enormous advantages. Um, and uh, so, Rick, you know, your CEO, I know you, you and she have a wonderful relationship. What's her comfort level with the cloud? When you use the word cloud, does she have a comfort level with it? Do you have to kind of do more communication to, with her about that? Or kind of what are your thoughts there? You know, Kathy's been wonderful. Um, but she's like other CEOs, she really wants to make sure that she takes care of the things for our members. So she puts a trust on, on myself and our IT staff to, to get all that stuff done. But we have to educate them as well. So we go through some education with her, with the management team, as well as with the board. We have to do that on a continual basis. Some of the board get, you know, sometimes they, they'll say, what does this mean? What does that mean? And so we go through that whole entire, uh, these are the acronyms for this. And as, as Silly as that sounds, that's part of education for them because that changes too. And as geeks here, we have a different lingo, right? We have different terminology that we use. And sometimes when we go into meetings such as, you know, accounting meetings and they start talking their GLs and things like that, our, our eyes gloss over. And so just continuing to talk to her, keeping that communication, keeping that education going. And from time to time, she'll send me an email saying, hey, do you know about this? What can you tell me about this? So it's great to have that communication back and forth between us. Yep. you got to keep the lines of communication open. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, John, obviously you have leveraged the cloud. I mean, you mentioned the relationship earlier with your core provider. Would you consider that a private cloud type of relationship, or what, is, what are your thoughts about cloud? Yeah, it's private. I mean, there's a big difference between, like, co-locating in another physical facility that you don't own and manage – uh, you could do that. I've I've also done where we did um, hybrid cloud where our data was being replicated to hardware now that we didn't own. So we not only didn't own the building, we didn't own the hardware. It was multi-tenancy. I think at that point you're starting to deal with a little more risk. Um, but then there's also times where the, the cloud provider owns the application like Dropbox. So not just the hardware, but now they own the application. And so they dictate uh, the application layer traffic too, and you really don't have insight into that unless it's open source. Um, I would say we are pretty open to adopting everything up until application. So uh, as long as I can encrypt the data and I own the keys and it sits on someone else's hardware, I kind of don't care. Uh, problem solved as far as I'm concerned. There's a little more hesitancy when they own the application and they might own the keys. I mean, I know a local provider in Orange County that is a pretty successful multi uh, multi tenant uh, service provider for private cloud. He hosts virtual desktops for a number of companies, nobody in the financial sector, but they don't even have a CISO on staff. Like, <laughs> they're super gifted at infrastructure, no talent dedicated to security, and yet they're hosting desktops. Uh, yeah. I guess well, that, you mentioned the, they own you the mentioned application, the, though. Well, and you mentioned the encryption. That's really uh, key. And and um, the fact that uh, you are the only one that maintains that encryption key, not the vendor yes. or the provider, that's, uh, you know, like you said, um, we have to kind of trust 256-bit level encryption at this point, but the, uh, you know, that is best practice, obviously. So making sure that you've got that encryption key. 
We're uh, getting hey, close here to wrapping this up for everybody. Um, Lee, can I touch on one one other thing that I like to yeah, point out about Rick. that? Yeah. Uh, it's really important that we also get partners that you know we have different availability zones. So these AZs should have separate data centers and that are designed for a disaster, right? Um, so they run independently and they're resilient to other failures. So if, for example, we have a data center that is in Northern California, if that data center, if the whole California falls into the water, right, and we have to go elsewhere, it may be better if we have a data center that actually rolls over somewhere like in Colorado or maybe to the East Coast. Yeah. And so that's really important that we put that into our, into our, our plan as well so that one, one data center or one cloud source does fail over to another so we don't have one single po point of failure. Yep. Yeah, backups of backups. <laughs> it's uh it's it's absolutely required. So, uh but it's worse if your backup goes down just like you did because you're in the same region. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, they call it the uh, belt and suspenders uh method of data protection. <laughs> so, um six must do's. And these are these are all best practice. This uh this should be some pretty obvious stuff here. Again, Captain Obvious. Um, identify all data to be protected. I, I like to underline that word all. I, don't be afraid if it requires additional technology, additional licensing, whatever it is. You can't really segregate data and say that data is not really important. If we were to lose it, it's not such a big deal. It probably is a big deal. So keep that in mind. Uh, we talked about RTOs, recovery time objectives. Um, you know, go through your data, whether you want to look at it by department, by uh, by host, by uh, server, however it is, but try to develop clear RTOs for that data protection. Um, I think best practice is to have, uh, at some level of your data protection strategy, multiple retentions, going through those um, daily, weekly, monthly, annual retentions. Um, data must be out of the region. The, the word region is so ambiguous, but Think about Hurricane Sandy. That affected uh, four of the, uh, there's 10 or 12 FEMA zones. So, um, you know, it, it, it affected a lot of uh, the, basically the whole eastern United States. So when we talk about our data being out of the region, you know, uh, 10 miles away may not always be best practice. It may need to be further away. John mentioned data encryption. You should be the only one that has those encryption keys for your data. Um, you have to have your data has to be encrypted. It has to be encrypted at rest. It has to be encrypted in transit. Um, encryption, encryption, encryption. Um, the solution must be unattended. Uh, you know, whatever whatever you're doing, don't rely on on uh, you know a, a, a network engineer or someone on your staff to have to push buttons, uh, change drives, change tapes, take boxes to different locations. That person goes on vacation or gets involved in projects, um, you know that definitely can uh, can cause some challenges for your solution. There's enough technology out there where you can have these uh, you know these types of things kicking off in the middle of the night or at different points in the day to protect that data. You know another button or bullet that I would add to this, and this came up. Rick brought this point up was testing. Um, Again, we're, we we use the word backup a lot, but really this is about recovery, and that recovery has to work. So be sure to kind of test uh, whatever solutions you have in place. Do that testing on a on a regular basis. Um, John and Rick, any other kind of thoughts here that you guys would throw out uh, as we sort of wrap this up uh, today? John, nothing here. All right, Rick, any thoughts? No, I think I'm good. <laughs> All right. So, uh, questions. There's a little question box over on the right hand side there. Your uh, that go to meeting. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to throw out to us, um, you know, again, we tried to kind of do a different format with this. Hopefully, you have seen some value uh, from having your peers, um, you know, some really sharp IT professionals, John and Rick, on the call here today. Um, it's one of the things that. Uh, we're going to try to do more of. I think that that again, one of the values of credit unions is the ability to do this collaboration to uh, to help each other. And uh, hopefully, you've got some good takeaway from uh, from today's uh, presentation. Um, we have some uh, some gifts for you today. Uh, so takeaways. So uh, those of you that uh, were on the call today, 
we've got a, a few documents. One of them is kind of, we put together sort of a, a data protection scorecard. It's a one pager. It's simple. It's going to take you five minutes to do, but uh, take a few minutes, go through it, go through the questions, and you don't have to share the information with anyone, but take a look at uh, your scorecard, see if you're a data protection superstar, see if you have uh, done all that you can to, um, you know, uh, protect your data. So here are the uh, resources we're going to send you. We've got a document on uh, compliance requirements for credit unions. Um, we also have a document, uh, again, this event was sponsored by eVault. eVault was recently uh, ranked number one uh, in cloud data protection kind of a cool um, document there. It's a one-pager, but it gives you some good information about how eVault ranked against other vendors like Veeam and Unitrends. And then there's that data protection checklist. Again, that's kind of a little scorecard for you. Hopefully, you're a data protection superstar. If not, then uh, maybe you'll get some new ideas based on uh, today's information. So uh, with that, I'm going to kind of wrap it up. We've got a couple minutes over, um, but I really appreciate everyone's time today. If I can help with anything, there's my email address, leebird at btechonline.com. Um, I really want to thank Rick and John for being on the call today. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your time. I know we're all busy, but you guys really provided some good insight today. Um, I also, again, want to thank Evolt. They put a lot of energy into uh, putting this uh, presentation together. I appreciate their assistance with it. Um, Feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email if I can help with anything. And uh, really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. We've got a weekend coming up in a day, so uh, make it a great one. I appreciate it. With that, we're going to end the presentation. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.